<laughs> yes, thank you, Bob. I'm delighted to see all you out in the frozen tundra here today. Um, uh, it was um, 16 when I left Gallatin a while ago. Oh, sorry, sorry. You know, I, I do have a school teacher voice, and, and, but yelling all the way back there may be challenging even for me. Um, uh, it was 16 degrees when I left Gallatin a while ago, so I'm delighted to see all of you came out today. Thank you very much. Now, uh, back when I started to school, and I'm sure this is about how it was taught when you, were st you started to school as well, you were taught history. Uh, it was political and military history. And that was just the whole entire contents of the course. In American history, you went from president to president to president. And there'd be a war. We'd add a general in. Then we'd go back to presidents, presidents, presidents again. And then we'd add another general. And so it wasn't really until the 60s uh, and the Civil Rights Movement that we started looking at history in a slightly different way. We started looking at history uh, really from the bottom and looking up at, rather than looking so much at who was at the top, who were the leaders. And yes, the leaders certainly were important to the story uh, and certainly active players, but there were a lot of other people whose names we don't really know very much. Uh, we don't know very many of those people's names. We don't know very much about them, but there were plenty of other people in the story. And so we suddenly started adding social history uh, and cultural history to the mix. Now today we are going to have traditional political history because I think we need to set the stage for what's coming. So I will give you uh, pretty quickly my little uh, uh, way of organizing, organizing history which is around some big questions and in the history of the United States whether it's the, the history of our country, the history of our state, or the history of our community here. In the United States, I look at this with three big questions. Now, the first big question, which is one uh, we're still debating today, they were certainly debating it in 1787 when they were attempting to write the Constitution, and that is, what is the role of government? In other words, to put it in a slightly different fashion, what do we want the government to do? Now keep in mind, it's not what we want the government to do necessarily totally for us, although some people might look at it that way. It's what should the role of our national government be, or in Tennessee, the state government, or here in Nashville, uh, the metro government. What should the role of the government be? The next question I think we need to ask, and we're going to hit on all of these before this six-week course is out, is what should our nation, uh, what should the relationship of our nation, the United States, be with the other countries of the world? What should the United States foreign policy be, if you want to put it that way? What should our relationship with Mexico be? Should we have a different relationship with Mexico from our relationship with Europe? Well, how involved in world affairs should we be? And certainly in the middle of that is, of course, World War I, which we're going to begin talking about next week. And then the final question that I think needs to be asked in any history class is, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be a Tennessean? What does it mean to live here in Middle Tennessee in metropolitan Nashville or the surroundings from metropolitan Nashville? So today we kind of start looking at these questions. What is the role of government and what, wh who were the key players and what were the issues of the time? And we'll start looking at this, and then as you see this evolves, part of the story of what the government is supposed to be doing, or what we want the government to do, what we think the government ought to be doing, part of it involves who is exactly an American. 
And we're still debating that today, and we were debating that in 1910 as well. Are some people more American than others? Do some people have more rights? And then, again, we tie all of this together. What is the role of the national government with relationship to the citizens and the people? So I'm going to start today mainly because... The local story is just so much more entertaining than national, the national story. And besides, you all have been exposed to the national story so much here lately. I brought my copy of the Bully Pulpit. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of class. But the local story of what was going on here in Nashville and the state of Tennessee is a tale that nobody, no writer of fiction, could possibly really make up. <laughs> now, um, as you know, we started this story in 1910. And by 1910, Tennessee was already completely dry. Uh, Senator uh, Edward Ward Carmack had been assassinated on the streets of Nashville late in 1908. There had been a big trial of Duncan and Robert Cooper, the two men, father and son, that had been accused of, of uh, killing, assassinating, if you want to call him that, uh, Senator Carmack. And it was indeed the trial of the century. The jury even went over to Centennial Park and posed for a picture in front of the Parthenon. And uh, um, it was an interesting trial because you've got in the middle of this fight people who call themselves reformers uh, are progressives because they want a certain level of progress. And, and uh, then you've got people who say things are all right, really just the way they are. And here we had gone in America, we had gone from the Civil War to this great industrial powerful nation. And that industry trickled all the way down to us in Gallatin. It trickled to, Ga I mean, in Nashville, it trickled to Gallatin. It trickled to you from Lebanon. It was trickling everywhere. Because the industrialists, even though they had kind of started up there in the north, they looked down south and they saw an opportunity. The opportunity was uh, people in rural parts of the South, meaning Lewisburg, Fayetteville, Lawrenceburg, Pulaski, you name it, Lafayette, can you believe that? They even had a factory. Um, uh, they saw opportunity because the wages are going to be a whole lot cheaper down here. And so what you see is northern industrialists coming into Tennessee uh, and, and building factories. And it would be a shirt factory, Salant and Salant, a blue jean factory, Oshkosh. Uh, you would see a, 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 a factory making some kind of of item that will ultimately become a part of a machine of some sort. And so Tennessee, in an odd, odd sort of way, had become industrialized. And, but the industry, we had a lot of industry here in Nashville. We uh, were one of the most um, significant flour manufacturers here in, in, the in the South, for sure, in the United States. And we have... Uh, uh, smokestacks, which are the symbol of progress here in Nashville. If you go into any museum in the United States and you see pic, uh, paintings of the 1890s, the painting that said, we are a thriving city, was a, a lot of smokestacks belching out big clouds of smoke. Not good for our health, but we didn't know it at that time. So uh, we have, have industrialized here in a kind of an interesting way, uh, and we are industrial. But what we have here at the turn of the century, and, and this is what, how Senator Carmack and some reformers uh, saw the need to make some changes. Uh, and, and Senator Carmack had taken on the cause of absolutely eliminating alcohol manufacture, sale, and consumption. And this really very, very quickly 
by 1890, 1900, and certainly by 1910, had taken on uh, a racial aspect. And the aspect of that was, as we are, are entering the period of Jim Crow segregation, that these poor African Americans are drinking gin, uh, whatever, gut whiskey, and they are getting drunk and they're out there raping white women. And that was the flame, that was the gasoline you could pour and the flames would ignite, whether it was in Salina, Tennessee, or whether it was in Nashville. And so as we progress to about 1908, Senator Carmack had, had gotten on the bandwagon of this. He had been a United States congressman and had actually done some kind of interesting things as a congressman, but he had decided uh, when he was not reelected to the United States Senate to run for governor, and uh, that's where the, his uh, end takes place pretty quickly. So here we've got this cause of limiting alcohol, prohibition. And it has really gotten some steam of its own because by 1900, the women have seen an opportunity to get involved in a cause. Now, let me tell you, they were involved in lots of causes, but the WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Union, grew bigger than any organization of women have ever grown. Uh, my friends, the lady suffragists, they were, they were tiny compared to what the WCTU was like. They were enormous. And in Tennessee, they had uh, been a tiny little organization until a woman from Fayetteville took the helm of the state organization, Selena Holman, and soon we've got chapters of the WCTU everywhere. And they are definitely wanting to limit to, uh, uh, alcohol, to prohibit alcohol, uh, but they have a whole agenda of a whole host of other things they are on. So Senator Carmack sees all of these women taking up the cause of prohibition, and he wants to run for governor. And keep in mind, generally, the big race for governor was in the Democratic primary. Now, Tennessee, as a little aside here, Tennessee is slightly different from the other 10 states that left the Union. You know, we were uh, number 11. Uh, in that we didn't always vote with the solid South. We, we often voted Republican, and Tennessee, after Reconstruction, elected a Republican governor every 20 or 30 years for one reason. The Democrats got into such a big fight about something that the Republican was able to come in and win the election. So they had certainly fought about the, the state debt. They, they were fighting about prohibition now. So, Malcolm Patterson, who was from Memphis, who had no use for prohibition, uh, felt that, yes, we do need to, to regulate alcohol, but it's the job of the counties and the cities, not the job of the state. And Senator Carmack, he was an opportunist, and he saw these votes and the power of this. Even though you women can't vote, you can certainly berate the voter that you live with. And so uh, uh, Senator Carmack sees opportunity, and so immediately the newspapers get involved in all of this and start taking sides. And of course, here in Nashville, it's always been kind of, it doesn't necessarily philosophically make sense who's, which newspaper is on which side. It's all about teams. And if, if you're on my team, if you're on uh, Eddie Stallman's team, then you're not on my team. And this was true even in 1900. Uh, Luke Lee, uh, who uh, is a very well-known person in Nashville history, uh, had, had bought and, and started the Tennessean. And he was a supporter of Senator Carmack. Now, another paper that we have in town 
is the Nashville American, and the Nashville American is owned by Eugene Lewis. Now, Eugene Lewis is not a name that any of you all would really just readily necessarily know, but he is is one of the officers in the Ellen N. Railroad. And so he had supported the LNN. The LNN took full credit for the Centennial Exposition, but, Lou, uh, but Eugene Lewis had made lots of people in Nashville mad and the LNN because they barred Jerry Baxter's Tennessee Central Railroad, something, a, a, an emotional thing for us, out of the Union Station, and uh, Nashville had not forgiven uh, the LNN Railroad nor Eugene Lewis for this. So here we have the Nashville America as being pro uh, uh, Patterson, and Luke Lee is pro uh, Senator Carmack. And, and, and in the primary, it is a nasty, nasty fight, but in the primary, uh, Malcolm Patterson wins, and he will go on to win the election in uh, the fall against his Republican uh, opponent. Now, having said that, we've now got to find a job for Senator Carmack. Well, Luke Lee has a job for him, and actually, Senator Carmack had qualifications for the job. He had been a newspaper man. He had come up in the newspaper business, Columbia, Nashville, Memphis, back to Nashville, and so he becomes the editor of the Tennessean. And this is how this huge story gets going uh, with, with uh, him criticizing not only Governor Patterson, but Governor Patterson's supporters, uh, the, the Coopers, and there are shots fired on the streets of Nashville in uh, 1908 uh, when these two, these three men come around the corner and uh, find each, hit, hit each other. And we simply don't know exactly what happened. There are a couple of books that describe this. Uh, actually, Jim Somerville has a book about this, The Carmack Shooting, uh, that was published, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. And there's an older book by, I believe the author is Paul Isaacs, Prohibition uh, in Tennessee, which is a, a pretty descriptive uh, uh, narrative of the whole issue of prohibition and the assassination of Senator Carmack. So all of that is to say that after the Coopers were tried, the Governor Patterson pardoned them, and that really sort of sealed it up for Patterson's political future. Uh, he didn't, I don't necessarily think he thought that at the time, but uh, you can imagine, after, after uh, Senator Carmack is killed, you can imagine the furor about alcohol and Patterson, and let's just mix it up as much as we can. Prohibition is the way to honor the memory of Edward Ward Carmack. So we vote Prohibition in here in Tennessee. Now, here we are in Nashville. Nashville's supposed to be dry. Um, our mayor is um, Mayor Head, who is a wet, but he certainly doesn't like Lewis, Eugene Lewis, because of the whole flap about the Tennessee Central Railroad. Uh, so he's not really very much interested in enforcing uh, the laws regarding saloons here in Nashville, the East Ends of Sin. And uh, he, he, he's trying to ignore it here in Nashville, but when it's time for another election, he's not going to be able to ignore it. And let me tell you, you know, you see some lows in politics, but one of the images, the prohibition is flouted, and I valiantly tried to find one of these, a, 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 a bottle, actually. If you all have one in your cabinets, call me or see me after class. Um, a Levy's Gin Bottle. Now, well, what's so what about Levy's Gin? I don't think Levy is in the gin manufacturing anymore. Well, this brought out the worst anti-Semitism you could ever imagine. 
And, and the way that this was packaged was Jews are selling gin to black people who are out there raping white women. And so uh, it was really, really nasty. And supposedly, now this, the information that I have about this is really uh, thanks to Don Doyle, who taught for many years in the history department here at Vanderbilt, but he now teaches at the University of South Carolina. And he was very interested in local government. The very best book about Nashville history during this period of time is his book, and it really is the only book. He wrote two books, Nashville in the New South and Nashville since the 1920s, and they are uh, the only real books we have uh, about this time period. And so according to Don Doyle, uh, this allowed people to attack blacks, it allowed people to attack Jews, and, and not so much physical attacks, but verbal attacks here in Nashville. So the General Assembly passed statewide uh, prohibition. Governor Patterson promptly vetoed it. His veto was overridden, needless to say, and uh, a service of thanksgiving for this was held at McKendry Methodist Church. I know there are two or three of you that go to church at McKendry, so there was a service of thanksgiving for this held. And because we in Tennessee have now routed the devil, the devil being alcohol. So, what, according to Don Doyle, this victory for the moral reformers, and they put this in the call of progress, this victory for the moral reformers actually created the system, what you need to sustain machine politics, to sustain a political machine. Now let me say that again, I'll see if I can say it in a different way, because I think this is really, really an interesting observation. Don Doyle said that if we hadn't voted through statewide prohibitions, the two big political machines in Tennessee, meaning Boss Crump, the one you know the most about in Memphis, and the machine of Hillary House right here in Nashville, they wouldn't have had anything to do. These would never have happened. Now, you can agree or disagree with him, and it's kind of interesting. Somebody really ought to write a study of these, southern, these two southern political machines versus Tammany Hall or the machine in, in Kansas City that Harry Truman grew up out of. His political growing came out of that machine the Pendergast machine in Kansas City. It would be interesting to compare our machines to theirs. But here we've got now a, a job for a machine politician to do. So let me just make sure we're all kind of on the same page about machine politics. You have a group of people who want to control government, and how do they do it? They provide services to people. They provide jobs on some occasion, uh, occasions, many occasions, actually. They provide jobs, and they stay in office because of their services to constituents or voters. And so here we have Hillary House developing a really, truly political machine at the very same time time that boss Crump, Edward Crump, is developing his machine in Memphis. And they both, the machines get the engines running when prohibition becomes the law of the land. Okay, a little bit about Hillary House. And, and if you have lived in Nashville all your life, this is kind of the story of many of your parents and grandparents. He was born right after the Civil War, 1866, born in Rutherford County, lived on a farm, a bunch of brothers and sisters. And so when he became a teenager, 1884, he decides to leave Rutherford County and seek his fortune in 
Nashville, and we have lots of young boys, uh, whether they came from Columbia and started selling insurance, whether they came from Dixon, we have lots of these young men coming into Nashville at the turn of the century looking for opportunity. So Hillary House got himself a job in a furniture store. He was paid $3 a week, and he enjoyed it. He was a very social person. He soon uh, is able to bring his, some of his brothers and sisters, the ones that want to leave, to Nashville. He gets them jobs. And then it, it, in 1900, he and his brother Kai open a furniture store called the House Brothers. And uh, it is downtown. He is a gregarious fella. He loves people, and so you know that he is a likely political candidate. So as I understand it, he wore a bright red vest, he wore a derby hat, and in his younger days he had a big fluffy black mustache. So he did look kind of the part of a politician here in Nashville. So his first job was to get elected to the Democratic National Committee. Then he got, I mean, the, the, the Democratic Committee of Nashville, not national, Nashville, Davidson County. Then he got on the county court, and, you know, he's never one to miss an opportunity. We need some bridges. He takes full credit for the building of two bridges across the Cumberland River. I imagine he had some help, but he took credit for that, and his people liked it. He took credit for planning the tuberculosis hospital in um, <coughs> Uh, which opened in 1910, and uh, he, you know, that was something that we desperately needed. Lots of people across the state uh, were dying of tuberculosis. So he, one job leads to another. He's elected to the state senate, the Tennessee state senate, and he... Uh, is re-elected to the state Senate. Now, some of the things that Hillary House sponsored in the state legislature did not go over too well. Tennessee's state legislature is really controlled by rural, rural forces. And some might say it still is controlled by rural forces. But certainly in 1910, the rural uh, uh, districts controlled what was done in Tennessee. So he proposed a bill when he was in the legislature. He introduced a bill to repeal the law against betting on horses. And we'd had a, a racetrack here, the Cumberland Park racetrack that had closed. And, and he thought people enjoyed going to the races and betting on the horses. So he introduced that. But remember, we're moral reformers, at least on the outside. So we will have none of that horse racing in our state. So he, Hillary House, supported Governor, he supported Malcolm Patterson when he ran in 1908 in the Democratic primary and won the general election. So here he is, he's at this point in his life, he is single, he's popular, people like him, you can't miss him on the street. I'm sure he was one of those people that never, ever, uh, met a stranger. He was always talking to people, what can I do for you? What's going on? So he ran for mayor in 1909. Now I've got actually some pictures here, a few anyway. Here we have the, big, the three that were in office when our uh, uh, story began. Uh, William Howard Taft, who had been elected to succeed Theodore Roosevelt uh, in 1908. He took the White House in 1909. Malcolm Patterson, who will be uh, exiting the picture here quite, quite, quite soon. And Hillary House in his later years. Hillary House didn't live as long as Boss Crump. Boss Crump lived up in the 50s. But Hillary House has a political comeback like nobody else ever had a political comeback here in Tennessee. So here we have the uh, people who are holding office. And here is a younger version of Hillary House. He is sworn in. Uh, shortly after the autumn election. But he, uh, let me tell you about the election. Prohibition was a big issue. I guess I should say the enforcement of prohibition was a big issue. And House understood politics, so he understood quite well that you appeal 
to people who are dissatisfied with whatever the system is doing. You appeal to these people, and in particular the people who really were angry about prohibition's enforcement were working class people and poor. So we've got three different candidates in the race. Dr. Isaac Newton Hyde, who was a physician who wanted strict enforcement of prohibition, and he was ran also on a very openly anti-Catholic platform. Uh, he, he is running, James S. Brown runs on a law enforcement uh, the, the, he is the incumbent mayor. He runs on a law enforcement platform. And uh, Mayor Brown, right before the election, runs a, has a, a series of police raids. Well, you can imagine how many votes that got him, can't you, uh, raiding things. So Brown kept saying, you know, do the right thing here, people. He said, the question you've got to consider is, are you in favor of law enforcement here in Nashville? Or you just favor a wide open town. And he thought that would really scare people into action, but the answer was 76% of the vote went for Hillary House. So he was on his way. He was going to move, he was going to move, why is my thing, my computer now seems to be frozen. I mean, we may have to get the computer person, maybe. Let's see if it'll move now. Ah, there we go. Here we have a map of our political wards. Now, you won't really be able to read the fine print of this, but you can certainly see that some are lightly colored with uh, X's, uh, checks, and uh, others are white. And this is how our ward system worked. So you've got a significant white vote in East Nashville and South Nashville, but you see all of this other area really is African American voting, uh, in some cases Catholic voting as well. And those wards turned out very, very heavily in favor of a Hillary House. Uh, the city wasn't truly wide open, even during Prohibition. You did generally have to go to the back door of these places that were closed uh, and go in on Printer's Alley uh, if you wanted to be served. But House, he made it clear, we're not enforcing these laws here in Nashville. Uh, and the people uh, overwhelmingly thought that was okay and uh, had no complaints. Occasionally, the county sheriff would go out and arrest somebody. More likely than not, it was a bootlegger or somebody who was competing with the business in the city. Uh, but the grand jury usually refused to uh, indict the violators of these laws. So what we've got here, and really we had this all over the country eight years later when nationwide prohibition comes into the story, uh, is we've got this whole new network of bootleggers uh, organized to a high degree. Uh, they're underground, the saloon keepers are all tied up together, and they want to keep House in office. And House is very good at, at what he does. And what he does is he provides the people who voted for him, his supporters, with what they want. And so what he really has developed here, and there are positives and negative ways to look at this, but what Hillary House has really developed is a pretty substantial social welfare system. And you know, the progressives all want us to take care of the poor. They want the government to be taking care of the poor. Well, let me tell you, Hillary House, he was actually doing it. He dispensed charity. His people were constantly in the winter taking buckets of coal to people's houses, box of groceries, and of course, his team mobilized his voters on election day. 
And African Americans were very excited about this because the last time an African American had been elected to the, to the city council to a place of leadership had been James Napier in the 1880s. And so now we see the opportunity for uh, African Americans, one or two possibly, to be elected to public office. And so he is out there, Hillary House, providing genuine charity, and he is a really shrewd politician. He really, really knows how to work uh, effectively for his constituency. So everyone seems to be happy with him except the business progressives. And they were progressive, but it was a very different strain of progressives. And, you know, uh, the writers who study the progressive era today, they look at it as kind of a mixed bag. It has a kind of a mixed bag. On the one hand, the progressives came in and said, we need government to be more active. We need government to regulate industry, regulate these robber barons that have come up out of the uh, Gilded Age, we need government to be more active in our economy, particularly every time we have an economic crisis. Uh, the, these progressives were saying, we need government to uh, be more regulatory. An, a criticism of the progressives, and a, a, a sadly a progress, uh, criticism of all these women like Jane Addams who were progressives, a criticism has been that the progressives, particularly the women, did not really have any understanding at all of the problems of the poor. They were middle class women with time on their hands. They often had lots of domestic help. Uh, they had no understanding of what it really was like to work in a textile mill and have your children left at home or have your children working in the textile mill uh, with you. And so here we have uh, the business community in Nashville who are really talking about we need progressivism all right, but what we need is efficiency and economy in government. And yes, we do need government to provide some educational services, but the business progressives say what we really need to do is organize our local city government in a smarter, more business-like way. And so they saw government as having the image of a big corporation, and that's how they wanted it to run. And so here is Hillary House who's out there saying, look at what I'm doing. I'm putting playgrounds in your neighborhood. I'm putting parks here. I'm cleaning up the slums. Look at all of these things I'm doing. I'm giving health stations. You know, one thing we forget about is if you didn't have a refrigerator, or I guess it was called an ice box in those days with the ice man coming to deliver, in the summer, your children had no milk to drink because they had no way to keep the milk cool. So actually having a way to keep milk cool in the summer was a huge step up the social ladder. And so what Hillary House did was among other things, he established in the heat of the summer in July, August, and September milk stations around the city so that you could take a pail and go get free milk for your children. And that was a very popular thing. There were milk stations in several of the poor neighborhoods. So he promises higher salaries for teachers. He promises textbooks. And he promises he's going to get a new high school built downtown, which becomes Hume Fogg. He relied on the black voters, so he was very conscious of services to the larger African American community, the Carnegie Library. He took credit for, now there are a lot of different people who take credit for this, but he took some credit for TSU, Tennessee State Agricultural uh, and Industrial uh, College, 
really getting off the ground. You know, the Morrill Act, the Land Grant Act that created the fund for these land grant colleges had been created before the Civil War, but it took uh, a while for us to get a, a college here, and then it took t uh, the Tennessee A and I a while to really get established. He built. He he was instrumental in the building of Hadley Park, which was the first public park for African Americans, not just in Nashville, but Hadley Park. Did you know was the first public park for African Americans in the United States? So that's pretty. That's actually pretty interesting. When he went to the dedication of Meharry Hospital, uh, the George Hubbard Hospital at Meharry, Richard Boyd, one of the members of the Boyd family, got up and spoke about how much African Americans were appreciative to Hillary House. He said that the blacks in Nashville love and respect Mayor House for being so broad. He is the mayor of all the people, black and white. So, he will, needless to say, have an opponent when he runs for re-election two years later in 1911. Uh, the opponent that runs against him is William Gillespie. He is a local dentist, and he runs, you guessed it, law and order, enforcing the law. William Gillespie won the suburban wards, the white ones on the map, but he didn't do well in the working class neighborhoods, the Black Bottom, the area uh, along the Cumberland River, but also some of the creeks as well. Uh, he didn't do well in, uh, uh, Gillespie didn't do well there, and so, here we have uh, House, once again, large margin of victory. And the Nashville Banner uh, is not too happy about this. They, in their paper, uh, right after this election, 1911, they say, but for this large Negro vote cast for Mayor House, Dr. Gillespie would have been elected mayor. And that's true. I mean, that's, there's no question, question about that. So, okay, business reformers, you're going to have to come up with another strategy. You have not succeeded this time around in taking him out. So after this, they start looking at the form of government. Now, they don't exactly come up with consolidating the city and county in 1911, but we're going to get to that pretty quickly here. Uh, not in this course, but another time here in Nashville. Uh, but what they do is pro propose a new system of local government that the progressives have touted, and they've already been establishing it around the country, a commission system of local government. Now, the way this works is you don't have a city council, you have a city commission. And the first one of these, as I understand it, was uh, Galveston, Texas, which had to deal with the, the hurricane. And so they had adopted this after the devastating hurricane of 1900, and others had followed suit. By 1913, Memphis, Knoxville, Chattanooga, and Lebanon all had adopted a version of the plan for a commission government. You're going to have five commissioners who serve as the executive and the legislative and some judicial here. And uh, actually, for uh, uh, those of you from Gallatin, who, who are here, Gallatin voted this down. But Lebanon had, had, had adopted this. And so the Board of Trade, the Nashville Board of Trade, we have two business organizations here, the Nashville Board of Trade and the Commercial Club, they supported this, and they had supported some, sp they'd sponsored some legislation to get this done in uh, uh, 1911, but it hadn't succeeded, and they really thought that the breaking of the reservoir in 1912 on 8th Avenue, that that crisis would propel Nashville to have to adopt this new system of government, but Nashville dealt with that pretty well. It was, you were able to blame it on public works. I mean, don't you blame everything you don't like, the dead squirrel in your road or something on public <laughs> works, or better, and we here at this, at this gathering, we call. We don't just get mad. We call our council person and tell them to get whatever it is out of the road that we don't, we're not happy about. So, uh, he, 
thinks the commercial club think they're going to be able to use uh, a new form of government to get rid of House, and they plan this this five-member commission, all of which will be elected. They'll have four-year terms, but the terms will be sta uh, staggered. So the mayor, one of the five, he will be the mayor, or she, uh, since women couldn't even vote, I doubt we were going to elect a female mayor in 1913. Uh, he, the mayor would be the Department of Public Affairs, Police, and Health. The finance commissioner would be in charge of finance, lights, and the market house. Uh, we would have another commissioner in charge of streets, sewers, and sidewalks. Uh, another commissioner would be in charge of fire, sprinkling, and building protection. And then finally, we would have a commissioner who is solely in charge of the waterworks, uh, street cleaning, and the workhouse. We had, we had a workhouse, a city workhouse, and uh, this would be uh, the fifth of these commissioners. So the commercial club really put forth an earnest campaign. In their little newsletter, the Tatler, they said, there is no odor in politics with this system. We are able to place our municipal affairs in the hands of responsible men, as opposed to who we've got now is implied. We're able to put our business affairs in the hands of responsible men, men with executive ability, not those who merely control a larger number of votes. Can you see where this is going? So, they want this through, but do you see the conundrum here? Do you see the hitch? They got to get it voted on. And who's, who has lots of support among the voters? Hillary House. So they, can, they have this great dream. They've got this vast vision, but they can't really do much about it without two things, state legislature and the voters. And oh, by the way, Hillary House is still in the state Senate, even though he's mayor of Nashville. <laughs> so they put forth their bill in the General Assembly, uh, and that is where the Commercial Club and the Board of Trade lost control of their effort. Uh, they... Uh, uh, wanted to get their bill through, so they were ignoring amendments that came along along the way. And even though House and his supporters introduced a, a substitute bill at the third reading, uh, the Board of Trade did not withdraw the bill. So needless to say, all of this is to say it's total confusion. I mean, what am I voting on? Who am I voting for? The rest of the people downtown uh, were asking themselves, uh, what am I supposed to be doing? So uh, they made some changes, and they got it through the legislature. But the key of the House substitution was that anybody could run for the commission. And see, House had been term limited so that he couldn't run for another term in 1913. But we vote this through, and House is going to get reelected because it's a whole new day here in government. So we've got the election of 1913, a showdown. Uh, you've got the machine politicians and the reformers, the old and the new. So we're going to have three tickets running for these commission seats. Now, some of you will remember, I've heard some of y'all talk about this, that after World War II, there was a G.I. Joe ticket, and Beverly Briley was on the G.I. Joe ticket, and, and the legislators from Davidson County ran uh, as a group, and so they would put forth five or six names, and you're my ticket, and you're this ticket. And so they put these tickets together. So we've got three tickets running for a variety of public offices here in Davidson County and state offices that represent the county as well. So the House ticket is the people's ticket. The reformers put forth the citizen ticket, 
which is backed by Eugene Lewis and his new newspaper. Uh, Luke Lee will take over the American and, and, and Lewis will start another paper, The Democrat, which supported returning to the segregated saloon district. Okay, we can have saloons, but they can only be in one little place. And he was very unpopular, uh, so Meeks didn't really have a chance. And then we have the home defenders ticket. <laughs> and this is the ad that they ran in the newspapers here. The home defenders ticket candidate is Noah Cooper. And uh, he says it's a simple choice. Good against bad. And look at who our, our, our shield is, holding his shield, protecting our home. It is candidate Noah Cooper. Here is a line from one of his speeches. Anglo-Saxons for 2,000 years have fought to protect the home. Now we have a battle on as great as that against the British or the Indians. It is a battle against the devil and all his works in Nashville. It's been a while since you've heard a political uh, politician saying they were going to war with the devil, isn't it? Um, so here we see uh, Mr. Cooper going to war against the machine, protecting the home, and uh, the Banner and the Tennessean both supported him. And, uh, you know, that was in some ways really kind of that, well, there are two downfalls here. Number one, these two papers supported him, and the reformers, the, the, the business reformers, really split their vote. If they had been uh, behind one, they might have had a better chance. So, House, are you going to rise to the challenge, Mayor House? Well, of course he is. He starts first order of business, a massive voter registration drive. And of course, you know the way you get voters registered. If they don't have any money, what do you do? You pay their poll tax. And so the machines out there, uh, the reformers complained that the, the Nashville City Police were out there registering black voters. And the banner ran a story about the registration of black uh, black voters who were working on, black men who were working on the railroad with the headlines, itinerant Negroes will hold balance of power throughout every Negro ward in Nashville. There's been a phenomenal increase in registration of that of two years ago. I mean, they are just fanning the fires of fear here. And so the voter registration shot up. We had 13,000 registered voters in the city of Nashville uh, uh, bef uh, in ni at the beginning of 1913, and at the end of 1913, we went from 13,000 to 19,000, which is pretty a substantial uh, race. Uh, House, he took a positive approach. He doesn't have to get down there and sling mud. So he tells everybody about all the accomplishments he and his uh, uh, supporters have accomplished uh, this new Hume Fogg High School school parks throughout the city of Nashville, noticeable improvement in public health, and House touted the fact that in Nashville under his term as mayor uh, in the last, in the two years before this election, for the first time in Nashville history, births had exceeded deaths. You know, we had so many children dying uh, uh, at birth or early and so many women, and, and now we've got more live births than we have deaths. So he took full credit for that. And the National Globe, Nashville's African-American paper, supports him, talks about all the things he's done, and, and they say that House has given more than his salary to the poor people. More than 5,000 colored people have been given relief in the way of clothes, fuel, medicine, or provision, said the Globe. So, we've got these candidates running, and it's neck and neck come election day. So, in the election, House squeaks out 52% of the vote. Now, 52% is certainly down from 75%, but it's more than 50 and so we don't have to have a runoff. And, it, and he would have had to run against one of the other two candidates. 
So he is uh, uh, elected. He is back in office. And I mean, the complainers are complaining all uh, all the time. It's totally incessant. The banner says the only reason he won was because an abundance of money and the most aggressive campaign Nashville has ever seen. What Don Doyle said in his book was, how simply beat the reformers in the business of, business of politics he understood so well. So the newspapers realize if they're going to defeat House, they're going to have to find a higher source to defeat House. So they're waiting around. They're looking for some opportunity, and they finally find it, the city debt. Now, we have a charter. We're operating under a charter in 1913 that was written in 1899. And in the charter, it forbade, you, the, the city could not uh, exceed, the, their budget could not exceed the revenues of the present year. In other words, when the city council and the mayor craft the budget, you got to look back at last year and say, how much money did we actually take in? Uh, you can't have a budget that's more than we got last year for the coming year here. So that became uh, uh, an issue here. And it was actually abandoned in a kind of an odd sort of way two years before House took office because uh, uh, the General Assembly Nashville needed some funds uh, for some projects it was working on, and so Mayor Head, who was two back from House, had uh, gotten the General Assembly to pass a special act, you know, one of those private acts just dealing with Nashville, allowing the city of Nashville excess expenditures for 1907 that were $75,000 over the revenue they had taken in last year. And, I mean, that was a pretty remarkable thing. $75,000 was a huge amount of money. So in 1909, we do it again, except this time the exception is for $250,000. And then in 1911, 1912, 1913, 1914, well, the legislature is giving us the authority to have a budget that exceeds, uh, that uh, $200,000 more are added to the pot. And so by 1915, we have deficit spending of over a million dollars. We've had tremendous growth here in the city. We've built roads, we've bit, built schools, we've provided social services, and, and the progressives certainly supported these things that were being done. The city couldn't raise taxes, the city couldn't float a bond uh, issue because the business-like government would not have supported that, uh, the, the people supporting business-like government. So now we have a crisis when the commercial club and the Board of Trade decide to make this public that we have corrupt officials who are to blame for this million dollars uh, that we are spend the deficit spending of a million dollars and they won't they refuse to blame it on the system that allowed this to happen in the, in the first place. So this, uh, the city goes to the legislature and asks for legislation for a bond issue to avoid some kind of public referendum. And uh, what the business community said was, well, we don't need a bond issue until we have an audit. And so what the business community calls for is an audit of the state's books. An efficiency survey is what it was called. And so they want the books to be uh, read and audited. And the commercial club puts money into the audit. The legislature allowed for the audit but didn't put any money in for it. So the commercial club uh, came up with the $2,000 for the audit. And uh, the, the city officials allowed uh, them to pay for the audit, uh, even though they were fearful of what the outcome might be. So, 
It's June of 1915, election in the fall. Mayor House announces that certain books required for the financial audit are missing from the revenue office. <laughs> 20 minutes of a tape? Perhaps does that ring any ring any bells? They've just vanished. They have just vanished. So rumors start immediately. Well, they've thrown them in the Cumberland River. They've burned them. All of this. So Hillary House once again he rises to the challenge. He takes the offensive. He suspends the city controller who was in charge of the books. Well, the city controller uh, uh, hires himself a lawyer. His, the controller was Miles Byrne, and gets an injunction to keep his job. And so now we're going to have lawyers going at it in every direction under the sun. So House is issuing a. Uh, um, uh, warrants for arrests of people. Uh, we are fighting, fighting, fighting. I mean, there's a whole scrapbook of clippings about this down at the public library. If you're interested in reading through this stuff, it's actually pretty entertaining. Uh, and so we start blaming everywhere. I mean, the legal profession never had it so good. Uh, they have lots of people to defend here in the court. So it finally, it, this is really to some degree, it kind of gets like those vigilance committees that San Francisco had uh, kind of doing your own investigation. So the Chancery Court of Davidson County appointed a special investigator to check all of this out. And there are charges everywhere, then more books are gone, and then it's revealed that more books are gone. And people, I mean, this is, this is a serious thing. These books are gone. And people are saying, oh, it's really just an April Fool's Day joke. And uh, that you don't know who to believe. You don't know what to believe. Pages of books are, uh, are missing. P pages have li been literally torn out of ledgers. And, of course, 1915 is the hottest summer on record in Davidson County. So, what are we going to do? Well, it's just one charge after another. The uh, uh, commissioner of the streets says that city wagons are being used to haul Negroes to, uh, out to work on this farm or that farm. Uh, people are, are calling everybody names. The, some people say we need to recall uh, may, uh, have a recall election. That was one of those really progressive ideas that the populists had, had begun. Let's have a vote uh, and recall. You'll remember a few years ago a California uh, governor was recalled. Uh, we uh, need to have a recall election, but that was going to require a petition, and you can tangle up a petition if you try to do that. So the next strategy was looking at the state laws. What can we use? Well, it seems that in 1909, when the legislature had passed statewide prohibition, they also passed a law that nobody paid any attention to called the ouster law. Now, what this gave the state legislature the authority to do was to oust, throw out of office, Anybody that citizens have accused, and there's a process for this, they have, anybody who has been accused of violating a state law. And so the next thing you see in July is an ouster suit to oust Hillary House from office and the other commissioners who were uh, uh, involved in all of this as well. So it's in the courts. It is the biggest mess. And then by August, the city is thrown into receivership by Chancellor John Allison. So we've got a, a lawyer, uh, John, Robert Vaught, taking complete a, tar a charge of the city's finances. And then that gets overturned. I mean, it's appellate courts. It's back to the lower court. It's up to the next court. It is one mess after another. And finally, in November, at his trial, Hillary House, 
he admits he hadn't enforced prohibition laws. He denied any wrongdoing, and he denied that he had anything to do with the scandal of the pages out of the books and the books missing themselves. So here we have moral outrage. He's not apologizing. He's, he's defending himself. So November 30th, he is ousted from office. Well, Hillary House, he has political resilience. Now let me show you the list here. There's our, there's our debt. That's how our debt went up. Now, you see, Hillary House was mayor of Nashville, 1909 to 1915. Then uh, Park Marshall serves a little bit of his term. And then in 1916, we elect Robert Ewing, uh, William Gupton, Felix Z. Wilson, Perry, Percy Sharp, and look in 24. Look who's back. And he will stay mayor throughout the worst part of the Depression. And I think you can understand, based on what I've told you about House, that there's a reason why he stayed mayor through the Depression. He was providing relief. Now, you know, we, we, we kind of don't know anything about Nashville's boss because Boss Crump uh, was ousted at the very same time, 1915, very same charge except not with the uh, uh, city's finances. And, and Boss Crump didn't really want to run the state of Tennessee. He just wanted to make sure that his people, Memphis, got their sh fair share of the state pie. And so Boss Crump was defend, you know, always trying to defend Na Memphis. He never held public office again. Crump never held public office. But he became the most powerful political operative in Tennessee until after 1952, uh, uh, when, and that's another long story, but Silliman Evans bought the Tennessean out of receivership in the 1930s, and uh, he uh, recognized that Boss Crump had too much power, so he uh, develops quite a team of supporters to, uh, as, as everybody that no, lived through this says, they broke the back of the Crump machine. That's the phrase that's always used. Broke the back of the Crump machine uh, in 1948 uh, with the return election of Gordon Browning and then in 52 with the election of uh, Estes Kefauver. So, uh, so nonetheless, Boss Crump's machine lived, but he never held public office again. So the reformers won, but they only won temporarily. And so we see a lot of fighting following in these years until House finally returns and brings a little order to this. And I think the Commercial Club and the Board of Trade finally kind of, by, by the time he comes back in 24, have given up. Tennessee politics during this period of time is not nearly, nearly as interesting as what was going on here in Nashville. Uh, as a result of the fight between Carmack and Patterson, when Patterson won, ran for re-election after Carmack's death, uh, Luke Lee and a lot of other people around the state supported the Republican candidate, uh, Ben Hooper, for governor. Ben Hooper was from East Tennessee, and they called him the fusionist candidate, the fusionist Democrat. The Democrats were fusing with the Republicans because they were mad at uh, Malcolm Patterson. Some call it the harmony, uh, uh, the harmony ticket. I've, I've seen that term as well. But... Uh, well, uh, Ben Hooper was elected governor uh, as a result of this, and he will, a Republican will serve as governor for four years. He actually wrote, I don't know, some of you all may have read it. Joe, you may, this is a book that you would have read. He has a little uh, memoir called Unwanted Boy, and it really, well, you sh it, it really is quite a nice story. He was an orphan, and I think it's very well written. Uh, it's a very, very nice story. So, my time is up. 
Uh, I have time to take questions if I'm not hooked up to some machine here. Um, I have time to take questions or hear comments, and we will start next week with William Howard Taft. Again, I, I, I'm, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin is not giving me a payback for this, but I highly recommend this book. It, I've read it, and I had a place marked to read to you, but I'll read it next week. Yes? Well, that is true. That's what they say. And the funny thing about Senator Carmack's statue, just the way the roads are, Senator Carmack's statue makes him look like he's the most important person in the whole state of Tennessee because he got lifted up. Well, why did he get so lifted up? The legislature couldn't cross Charlotte Avenue and they had to dig a tunnel under there. So let's name our tunnel for somebody who's made a contribution to our state. How about the Motlow family? Um, how did they make their money? I believe Jack Daniels. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> so only in Tennessee, only here, would we have the ardent prohibitionist standing on top of the <laughs> alcohol uh, tunnel. But I got one funny thing to tell you about that statue. Last year, I got a call uh, from uh, somebody here in town that I know. Uh, he actually goes to our church. Uh, and uh, he, the, he's a member of the National Transportation Lawyers Association, and they were having their national convention in Nashville. And so they asked me to speak at the National Convention of Transportation Lawyers, which I just was thrilled to tell Ray Busey I'd been invited to speak at a lawyer's meeting. And they wanted me to talk about the Carmack Amendment, which is an amendment to a transportation bill that has to do with interstate shipping. So he, before he got off on prohibition, he was actually... Uh, uh, an interest in his legislative career in some ways is more interesting. He was an anti-imperialist. He opposed the Spanish-American War, but he was also a racist beyond belief. And if you read Senator Carmack's speeches, they are blatant, but there were lots of politicians in the South giving those highly, highly racist speeches uh, in those days. He was not alone in that, but he, he had a, a successful legislative career as a congressman from West Tennessee. Yes? Well, Nash, his question is, how did African Americans get to vote during Jim Crow? First of all, Nashville, how, and I think that raises a bigger question, is how is Nashville different from Memphis? And uh, Nashville's African American community is different from Memphis for two reasons. One, Nashville had a middle class of African Americans from the very beginning because before the Civil War, we had a substantial population of free blacks here. And a lot of those African Americans in Memphis came out of the cotton fields into Memphis, and Memphis had some elite blacks, but they, were at, they, they didn't have this strong middle class. So we never had total Jim Crow. You know, James Napier was elected to the city council. He goes on to be appointed a U.S. treasurer, I think, by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, uh, we had African Americans, and part of that is because of the call of Fisk. You know, we have Fisk, and then we have one of two medical schools for African Americans uh, in the country here. And so we never had complete Jim Crow voting here. And, uh, he, and you know, at the, the white people really liked to tout the fact that they were registering black people to vote. But the fact of the matter is they were registering poor Irish Catholics to vote, and that Catholic vote has always been a part of Metro's political history. I um, mean, you all know, you know that, I'm sure. And so uh, it wasn't just blacks, but that was what got all the attention. And so um, it, it's a very, that whole history is also quite interesting. Bobby Lovett, who teaches at TSU, has a nice book about Nashville African-American history. 
Well, it's time to go. Now, I'll hang around here and answer your questions, hear about your family history or anything else. Have a good week.